Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and today we're going to talk about immunohistochemical stains for melanocytic lesions. Now, I have two videos on my channel about the basics of melanocytic uh, lesions. One is about nevi, and the other one is about melanoma. So if you haven't watched those yet, I would recommend you watch those first, and then come back and watch the immunostain video. Uh, that's because you'll understand the basic patterns that we're looking for here, and we're trying to use the immunostains usually to help us better assess those patterns when it's not really obvious on the H&E stain. And also because even with immunostains, the most important feature in the vast majority of melanocytic lesions is the histologic pattern, the, the basic pattern on H&E. Uh, immunostains are great, but they are only an adjunct, and H&E is still the king in my opinion. Uh, you have to start with looking at the lesion and looking at the pattern. Um, the vast majority of cases of melanocytic lesions, in my experience, uh, can be uh, diagnosed with accuracy using uh, H&E only and not needing immunostains. But there are a small subset of cases that are challenging and that immunostains can sometimes help us as dermatopathologists to better make the diagnosis or to, to make us feel more confident about the diagnosis in challenging cases. So again, don't neglect H&E just because you have immunostains. Immunostains can be helpful, but they can also get you into trouble if you don't know how to use them. I'm going to start this video uh, using this table. I'm writing, uh, some of you probably know, I'm writing a dermatopathology survival guide textbook that's going to be published by Innovative Pathology Press. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter if you want, and uh, they also have a website, and I'll put that in the video description down below. The book is still in progress. I'm working uh, my hardest to, to get it written quickly. Uh, we suspect it will be published sometime in 2019, uh, hopefully early 2019 if, uh, if I write quickly. So in any case, uh, be on the lookout for that. As soon as it comes out, don't worry, you'll hear about it on my YouTube channel and my other social media channels. And for this video, I'll put a link in the description down below once the book is available for purchase. So the reason that I'm uh, um, mentioning that is because this table is from my melanocytic chapter in the DermPath Survival Guide. And this is kind of my basic approach to uh, melanocytic immunostains and my opinions, my personal opinion about which ones are best for which situation. So I'm going to start with that and then the rest of the video will be <clears throat> a discussion of different cases and some examples ranging from Lentigo to nevus, dysplastic nevus, all the way up to melanomas. And uh, you can get a chance to see kind of how I handle these things practically in real life to give you a better example. So um, in any case, let's start with the, the first thing and the thing I probably use immunostains for the most is looking for pagetoid spread or confluent growth to help determine if something's a melanoma or not. In some cases, that can be subtle. My personal opinion, uh, the best stain is SOX10. It's a nice crisp nuclear stain, as you'll see in the rest of the video. MITF is also a nuclear stain and will work um, in this setting, although I don't, in, I've not found it to be quite as crisp. And also, it has very little utility outside of this one setting of looking for pagetoid spread in the epidermis. Um, uh, so basically, SOX10 can be used for neural things and other lesions. So I feel like SOX10 has more versatility in addition to being a cleaner stain. MART1 can be used in this setting, but you got to use it with caution because the uh, it can really overstain and make it look like there's a lot more melanocyte um, activity in the junction than there actually is. I highly recommend um, my own for myself and my own trainees to not use S100. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't stain the junctional melanocytes very well in normal um, in normal melanocytes at least, and then it also highlights Langerhans cells, which is messy. When we're looking, uh, it, uh, we've got an obvious melanoma in situ, but we want to see if there might be dermal invasion hiding in the dermis behind a bunch of inflammation or a regression. SOX10 or MART1 are very useful there. S100 can be used, but again, the dendritic cells and the Langerhans cells really make it difficult. I definitely do not like MITF in that setting because uh, MITF stains histiocytes, and it's relatively nonspecific. Um, once you get deeper than the epidermis, I feel like MITF is a very nonspecific stain. So I definitely recommend against it for looking at any dermal melanocytic proliferation. Um, I also recommend against it for looking for metastatic melanoma, for looking at sentinel lymph nodes. I don't use it for any of those things because I think it will stain so many things that are not melanoma. And I've seen people try to make a diagnosis of metastatic melanoma just because MITF was positive and every other melanocytic marker was negative. Uh, in my opinion, that's crazy and dangerous. So I definitely do not use MITF for those uh, those scenarios. All right, looking uh, for metastatic melanoma, SOX10 and S100 are my go-to stains. Same as for spindle cell melanomas in the skin of older sun damaged patients and trying to sort out spindle cell melanoma from spindled squame or atypical fibrosanthoma. S100 and SOX10, very sensitive, 
Um, not totally specific, of course, so you have to be cautious there, but they're very sensitive and they're, uh, in my experience, the best markers for those scenarios. MART1 or HMB45 could also be used, but you have to remember if, if MART1's positive and you think it looks like metastatic melanoma, then that's probably fine. But uh, MART1 is negative in melanoma sometimes, particularly big metastatic nodules of melanoma tend to, to lose MART1 and HMB45, but they more often will still retain SOX10 or S100. So uh, if you use these and they're positive, that works great in this setting, but if they're negative, and particularly metastatic melanomas and also spindle cell melanomas tend to lose that expression, then you have to do as a second round of stains either an S100 or a SOX. Uh, that's my opinion, at least in my personal approach. Desmoplastic melanomas, and I'm going to do a whole video about desmoplastic and also spindle cell melanomas at some point in the future. Um, they are uh, almost always positive for SOX10 and S100, but they are almost always negative for all of the other melanocytic markers. So MART1, HMB, nothing is going to help you there. S100 and SOX10 are your, are your go-to stains for desmoplastic melanoma. Again, plus the H&E pattern and the clinical scenario, which are really the most important clues. And then SOX10 and S100 just help you um, uh, further confirm the diagnosis. And for sentinel lymph nodes, I don't really talk about that in this video. The stains I personally prefer the most are SOX10 and MART1 because they're crisp and clean and very sensitive as well as specific in the setting of lymph nodes. Um, HMB45 can be used. Uh, I just I don't use HMB45 very much uh, in general in my practice just because I feel like it doesn't have as much sensitivity as MART1, and it's also kind of granular and less crisp in its staining pattern. S100 can be used in sentinel nodes, but I really don't like it to be quite honest because it only tends to work very well in my experience if there's a big nodule of melanoma there. And if there's a big nodule of melanoma, in the middle of a node, I probably don't need the stain to prove that. I can just look at it and see. But uh, S100 has a very dirty background in lymph nodes because, again, Langerhans cells, dendritic cells that are all in the midst of the node will all stain with that S100. So uh, S100 will have lots of staining in normal uh, reactive lymph nodes that are negative for tumors. So you got to be really careful in how you interpret S100 in that setting. I much prefer SOX 10 and MART 1. And again, I do not at all like MITF in that setting. So um, uh, MITF I don't use at all in my practice anymore, uh, but I used to use it and I think it's fine looking at, at this first uh, category here, but outside of that again, I really don't like MITF at all. So that's my basic approach to uh, kind of uh, how I look at uh, immunostains and what kinds of uses I have for them and which ones I prefer. Again, this is just my experience. I can't tell you what's best in your practice. Um, melanoma and uh, versus other things, trying to make the diagnosis of melanoma versus a nevus or versus some other tumor is a very serious thing because melanoma is such a, a potentially aggressive disease and there's legal risk and patient care risk. So as always, these videos are meant to be educational. Um, but they are not intended uh, to replace a formal consultation. If you uh, have a worry, uh, a worry about a lesion, I would recommend you get expert consultation if you have any concern that something might be melanoma and you're just not sure because so much rides on it for the patient and also potentially uh, for you as a physician. So this is, again, just my educational um, attempt to, to share with you what I do in my practice and how I think. And there are, of course, also exceptions to every rule. And there are times that, that these scenarios here I choose a different stain, uh, even though maybe I would say normally I want to use SOX10, I might want MART1 or something else in a different setting. It just depends on every individual case I have to make the best medical judgment that I can. So the remainder of the video is a, a series of lesions. I recorded these as multiple video clips over, over multiple different days. I've done my best to arrange them in a way that I think makes logical sense, hopefully. But, um, but if, if I have any part in there where I refer back to something previously in the video and it actually isn't there, it might be that I've put it further on in the video. I might have got the clips mixed up. So I apologize in advance if there's any of that here. But hopefully, at least these practical examples will be useful to you and give you a better understanding of how I use immunohistochemical stains. Uh, for melanocytic lesions in my own practice. So let's go over the basic melanocytic immunostains, looking at a, an intradermal nevus here. This is, I think, from a control uh, specimen that we use to prove that the stains are working. Here's a nevus that's staining with S100 protein. Okay, S100 protein strongly stains the vast majority of melanocytic things, both benign and malignant ones. And it tends to be a cytoplasmic and nuclear stain. So there usually is co-expression 
in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. Occasionally the nuclei can have weaker staining, but uh, usually you can see like right here, you can see that the nucleus and cytoplasm just totally, totally brown, very dark, very intense stain, okay? And if you look at normal skin, remember that that you don't only have melanocytes that stain, but here in the um, in the mid-level of the spinous layer, you also have other dendritic cells. These are Langerhans cells, and Langerhans cells normally live right in the middle of the spinous layer, um, and they stain with S100 also. This is why I do not like S100 as a marker looking for melanoma in situ. We're trying to assess the junctional um, component of a melanocytic lesion, the intraepidermal component, okay? It's very dirty, it's very hard to read. And the other thing that's kind of unusual about it is it doesn't tend to stain normal basal layer melanocytes in the regular epidermis very well for some reason. I'm not really sure why that is. It stains the Langerhans cells beautifully, but basal melanocytes in normal skin sometimes don't really pick up S100 that well, so I'm not sure why. And again, the nuclear uh, staining can be variable, like in this area here down in the, in the dermal part, deeper into the nevus. You can see some of the nuclei aren't having very strong nuclear staining, very weak or almost none, but the cytoplasm is very strong, okay? So S100 is a very, very sensitive marker for melanocytic lesions, but it's very nonspecific. Also, it stains a wide variety of other things, okay? But just so you know, that's there. I think it's a great stain if I'm looking at an ugly spindle cell tumor and I wonder, wonder if it's melanoma. S100 is a great stain there because uh, spindle cell melanomas, for example, often lose their other melanocytic markers, but S100 usually is retained at least in some areas of the tumor. But for looking at um, for looking for um, pagetoid spread or confluence, it's not a good choice in my opinion. All right, now let's look at MART1. MART1 or melan A, relatively, basically more or less the same thing. They're different clones, I think, but um, here, uh, let's see, you can see again this nevus, it's staining um, strongly, dif diffuse strong staining in the cytoplasm. This is a red chromogen, very useful. Uh, the red is very useful when we have uh, pigmented, uh, uh, lesions that have a lot of pigment and here even though it's actually a cytoplasmic stain it's so intense and so strong the staining in this case that it's kind of bleeding over and covering the nuclei so that can be a little bit of a problem sometimes depending on the intensity of the staining you can get staining in areas of the cell that you're not classically supposed to have staining in okay and MART1 is a cytoplasmic stain. Again, mostly it stains the cytoplasm. Again, it's bleeding over on the nuclei here, but you can see beautifully, look at this. This is a normal junctional melanocyte. So this is probably not part of the nevus, just a melanocyte in the uh, overlying skin. And you can see these long branching filamentous processes we call these dendrites, like branches on a tree. And they're made of cytoplasm and they feed the melanin to the neighboring keratinocytes. They stain strongly with MART1. And the problem with that is that when you have many of these, it can make the lesion look very busy, which I'll show you later in this video, okay? But this is a, a decent, a very good stain for melanocytic things in certain contexts, okay? But because of the cytoplasmic staining and it's staining the, these branching dendritic processes, I think it's kind of challenging to use this to evaluate a confluence or pagetoid spread in melanocytic lesions. Let's look at HMB 45, human melanoma black 45, HMB stands for human melanoma black. It's a stain that I don't use very often, um, and a couple of reasons. For one thing, let's just let's come back to go to high power first, then we'll come back to low power. At high power, you can see here are some normal melanocytes along the basal layer of the epidermis. It's staining the cytoplasm, not the nucleus, and it's staining those same dendritic processes that we saw in the MART1. Okay, so it's a very similar staining pattern to MART1. The one difference is that it tends to be. I don't know if it'll pick up well in the video, but let's see. Yeah, it's not quite picking up. It looks a little bit too too strong. Well, I guess you can kind of see. It's got a little bit of a more granular, kind of stippled, speckled looking staining pattern and, and is less crisp and solid than the Mart 1, okay? So for one thing, I, I feel like it, it, the staining pattern is a little bit easier to read on the Mart 1 than on the HMB45. The other thing is that HMB45 is not quite as sensitive, in my hands at least, as MART1. And the, the part of the reason for that is that melanocytic lesions like nevi, when they mature, they often lose expression of HMB45 as you go deeper into the lesion. And this can vary quite a bit. Sometimes there'll be a strong, dense band of staining along the superficial dermis, and if it's a compound nevus, in the, the, the junctional nests. And then in the deep dermis, as the lesion, quote, matures, and that's a topic you can look at my basic melanocytic 
um, pathology of melanocytic nevi video, I talk about maturation and what that means. But as you mature, you tend to lose expression of HMB45. HMB45 is um, an antibody that recognizes the GP100 antigen. The, it's a molecule that's part of the melanosome, uh, which is where melanin is formed in melanocytes. So the active melanocytes that are producing melanin tend to be at the top portion of nevi and not in the deep portion of nevi. And some nevi, like particularly these intradermal nevi that are probably congenital, they, they tend to have very little melanin production in some cases. And so I think that's why we are seeing very, very little HMB45 expression here. Melanomas tend to have a more HMB45 expression, but it tends to be patchy. And as you go deeper down, you'll see patchy staining. Sometimes people try to use HMB45 to help them assess if there's abnormal maturation in a lesion. I personally find that kind of tricky to interpret, so I don't use it very often in my practice, although I've, I, I try it from time to time, but I often don't find it to be very helpful. Okay, but just remember that you're not gonna have the strong diffuse stain like you will see in MART. HMB is not usually going to give you that. So the, the lower sensitivity, the staining pattern, the, the maturation stuff, all of those reasons are, are reasons that I don't tend to like HMB45 very much um, as a stain for most, for most things. So I don't use it often. And finally, my favorite melanocytic marker probably is SOX10. And let's see here where it is. Very nice. So here's the, the intradermal nevus. And you can see it's nice, crisp nuclear staining in the melanocytes in the dermis. You can see them tracking around this hair follicle and sebaceous gland, a feature that we often see in congenital nevi, but also in some other nevi. And you can see here in the um, overlying epidermis, that there's staining of background normal um, melanocytes that are located along the basal layer. Right here, here, there, here. So a really nice crisp nuclear stain. This one's a brown. We can also do it in red. I, I tend to like the red um, a little better for pigmented lesions, but if you only have brown in your lab, don't worry. That's I, I think brown is very, very useful. And I personally find this very useful stain for looking for confluent growth or pagetoid spread in the junctional component, the intraepidermal component of a melanocytic lesion. And so uh, this is the stain that I use when I, when I need to stain melanocytic nevi, which is only a subset of cases. The stain I'm usually using is SOX10 because usually I'm looking for subtle lentigo maligna type of melanoma in situ or trying to see if it's a uh, looks like a nevus but is actually a melanoma with pagetoid spread that's subtle that I can't pick out on the H&E. So I tend to use it when, it when the H&E pattern is difficult to assess or I'm having trouble detecting the melanocytes in the epidermis and I want to see more clearly how many there are and what pattern they are, they're in. That's what I tend to use SOX10. So again, this is the stain I really like. And SOX10 will stain neural tumors and a variety of other things. Some sweat gland tumors see it will stain a subset of the uh, eccrine coil. So it stains most, I think, spiradenomas and cylindromas and some other things as well. So uh, it's a really nice stain though. And if you're looking for a new stain to get in your lab, this is, this is one of my favorites. One of the ones I use most often in my practice actually. Here's a darkly pigmented lesion that is, uh, it's kind of got thin epidermis. You can see all along the basal layer, there's increased uh, pigment. And that pigment, again, is mostly in basal layer keratinocytes. Turn the light up a little bit here. And this is a good example of being able to see that the dark cells here, those are going to be your keratinocytes. These cells with really pale gray to pink cytoplasm, these are melanocytes here. A couple melanocytes here. So there are some increased melanocytes, but they're kind of sparse. They're not making any nests that we can see. But they're a little bit big. And large doesn't always mean bad, but they are kind of larger enough that you have, they have enough uh, cytoplasm here, you can clearly notice them and pick them out. That's a melanocyte there. Here's a melanocyte here. You can easily tell them apart from their neighboring keratinocytes. So again, really, you probably don't have to use a stain in a context like this because you can see them. But for the sake of learning, let's look at stains from a case like this. <laughs> 
This is the Mart 1 stain, and it's a red chromogen. And look at that, it looks so busy, so much busier than it looked on the original H&E. Uh, &E. And the reason for that is because of these cytoplasmic processes that you can see very nicely branching. See each of the dark brown cells? Those are the keratinocytes. They have, their cytoplasm is not staining. And then there's these little branching arms of dendrites, dendritic processes from the basal layer melanocytes that are spreading in between each of those keratinocytes. So again, all of these dendrites and cytoplasm overlapping each other from the melanocytes makes it look very busy and makes it look almost confluent. You could say there's like red staining all along the basal layer. Again, that's why I don't really like MART1 in this context. If you look closely, you can actually see there's a melanocyte body, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. Okay, but I think again, it looks really scary to the untrained eye. It also looks like, oh, maybe is there a pagetoid cell up here? Well, here's another trick. If you look right here at this cluster of brown and here's a cluster of brown here, if we cut a little deeper, what we would see is that there's papillary dermis on the other side. These are inner reedy spaces. See, this is an area like this or like this. There's a little dermal papilla there. We're just about to cut into it. And so because of the plane of section, we can't tell that actually this is a little bit maybe tangentially sectioned. So this area right here, even though that melanocyte looks like it's floating in the middle of the spinous layer, it's actually not. Look, draw a line over here. It's probably right at the same level as right around here okay so it's probably just attached to the top of a dermal papilla and if we cut a little deeper we could see that so rare cells kind of up in the mid level of the spinous layer don't get too worried about those being pagetoid spread unless they're abundant and especially if you have a tangential section remember that that uh, that it really can um, make it look like there's a lot more upward scatter than there really is oh, this is upside down on this piece here and again, on this, on this section here, you can see very nicely the, the cells, even with all the dendrites, you can see each cell body is spaced out from its neighbors, and easily you can tell that, they're, that there's not confluence there um, in this area. But in the other areas, it can look a lot more, um, a lot more busy and a lot, a lot busier and more difficult to tell apart from confluent growth. Let's uh, contrast that with SOX10. Now in this case, it's a brown SOX10. Usually red is preferable, but here's what a brown would look like. Brown can be a little bit trickier to interpret in lesions with a lot of pigment, but it still usually can be done. Like here, there's a bunch of pigment in the basal layer. But when you look at this, there's no problem at all telling which cells are melanocytes, the ones with the really dark brown nuclei, and which cells are keratinocytes, the one with that granular uh, melanin pigment in them over the tops of, uh, making little umbrellas over the nuclei of the basal keratinocytes. And again, there's an increase in number of the melanocytes, but they're, they're mostly in the, in the reedy, in the, either the sides or the tips of the reedy, and not much in between the reedy, and there's no pagetoid spread here and there is no nesting in the lesion. So you could, this lesion is probably a lentigo simplex. Uh, lentigo simplex probably is on a spectrum with uh, junctional nevi, and sometimes if you cut deeper, you'll find occasional nests. And it's, it's probably that these are kind of related to junctional nevi. And again, the distinction doesn't matter, right? If you call it a lentigo or a junctional nevus, they're both benign lesions. The most important thing here is that you don't confuse this with a melanoma. Uh, sometimes they can be very dark clinically and can get biopsied because there's concern that they might be um, something more aggressive like a melanoma, okay? But this is a really nice example that there's a, a lot of pigment in this lesion, but the melanocytes are actually not doing anything inappropriate. They're, they're just a little bit increased in number, but there's no, no nests even. Um, there's no pagetoid, no confluence, all right? And let me show you a different section from, I think it was a different piece from the same case. And this is, the, this is on the mart, okay? Again, and I apologize for all the background, there's a bunch of debris in the background on this case. But look, look over here what's happening. This area is sectioned tangentially, and the reason we know that is, look, there are islands of papillary dermis that are surrounded by epidermis. Whenever you see that, it means that the cut is not going straight down from the epidermis into the dermis, it's cutting at an angle. So you see those papillary dermal, kind of they look like islands surrounded by epidermis, and the epidermis is all linked together. That usually is a sign, I mean, it can be a sign in dysplastic nevus, bridging can cause that, but in a, in a, otherwise, in other lesions, when you see little islands of papillary dermis surrounded by epidermis, 
epidermis, and you also see kind of a funny shape. Look, the epidermis looks like it gets thickened here, and you can also see, look at the curve in the tissue. The epidermis curves. It's because this piece of tissue was folded when it got embedded, this little area, and when it's sectioned through, the area where it was folded or curved is cut at an angle, so you're seeing a lot more of the basal layer. So instead of the basal layer being one cell thick, like right here, the basal layer is several cells thick. It's not really several cells thick. We're just cutting at an angle, so we're seeing several adjacent um, uh, layers of basal keratinocytes right next to each other. And we're also seeing the melanocytes, bodies and melanocytes, uh, cytoplasmic processes, the dendrites, we're seeing those things. So it's, it's giving us a look at more of the basal layer than we're used to seeing in regular, normal sections. So I think it's really important, especially in, in anything, tangential sectioning can complicate dermatopathology, but especially in melanocytic lesions because it makes them look more cellular, it makes them look busier at the dermal epidermal junction, and that can lead you to the false impression of either pagetoid spread or of confluent growth. So I always try, if I see some, some area that looks tangential, I try to look away and go to a different area that's not tangential to see if that helps me out at all, okay? So in this case, we had a, a second piece of tissue from the same lesion, and so that was convenient. Let's look at a socks on that, this piece of tissue we just looked at here. And see again, the socks, there's nowhere near as many melanocytes in this area. Even though it's tangential on the socks, it doesn't look nearly as scary as it looked on the mark. And again, that's because a lot of what we were seeing on the mark was actually cytoplasmic processes from all those neighboring layers of cells that we are cutting through because of the tangential sectioning. So mark can be really helpful and really convenient. And again, even though it's brown here, with some practice, you usually can tell apart the nuclear, nuclear staining and the melanocytes from the background um, melanin. They, they do have a subtle difference in color. I feel, I don't know if it really works for other people, but I feel like the brown of our immunostains has an, almost an orangey kind of brown look as opposed to kind of a blackish brown look that melanin granules give you. If you look at them really, really close side by side, to me there's a slight difference in the color between this, which is melanin, and this, which is the nuclear uh, you know, actual staining, the dab staining that we use in immunohistochemistry. So I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just hallucinating that and maybe it works for you or it doesn't, but I think with some practice, usually you can tell it apart. So again, this is socks and this is a benign lesion, a lentigo simplex. Now I don't have an H and E for this case, but it's just another example of how in a, a lesion where you think there are more melanocytes than you want to be seeing at the junction, or maybe there's some confluent growth or something, that you can, with, um, with these immunostains, you can use that to help you in difficult cases. Usually you don't need it, but sometimes it can be useful. Let's see if I can get this to work. So even here from lower power, this is a SOX-10, and it's a brown, a brown SOX-10. You, can, you can't see the individual nuclei very well from this power, but what you can see is most of the melanocytes are down in the reedy, and there is very little in the spinous layer. There might be like one cell scattering up over here. And also in between the reedy and the, in the area over the papillary dermis, there are a few melanocytes here and there, but in general, the density of melanocytes is much less. Look, you've got melanocytes down the tip of, let me see, uh, down the tip of this reedy and then not very much in between. A few more down here, not very much in between. A good bit in this area, but again, it kind of spares that area in between. There's more down here, a little sparing of the in between. There's a nest in the dermis right there. And then this tip has more, and then in between, you've got three or four in here. But you see the density is much greater down in the reedy and relatively little in between. So you can kind of get a, a gestalt, like a low power visual impression by looking at this. If we go closer, you can see it better. And again, because it's brown, there is some pigment in this lesion. This was a lentiginous nevus. Again, a nevi that have kind of long, reedy, increased melanin pigment in the basal keratinocytes and kind of increased numbers of single melanocytes down in the reedy. I like to call those lentiginous nevi. It really doesn't matter clinically. In my opinion, it's just a pattern microscopically. I like to bring those up because I feel like those often look like dysplastic nevi. Um, clinically, they often look darkly pigmented and kind of flat and spreading. They look maybe like they could be dysplastic nevus or even melanin melanoma clinically, and they're often very darkly pigmented. And then microscopically, they're more challenging for pathologists because they have increased single cells, and they tend to have a lot of melanin pigment, both of those things of which can be challenging. So again, look here that the melanocytes really are, if you draw a line along the top of the papillary dermis, ah, I lost it. 
the vast majority of the melanocytes in this lesion, if we draw a line across, from, across here, the majority of melanocytes are gonna be down below rather than up above, and that's a good sign for uh, nevus rather than a melanoma. And again, okay, so there's one cell up there. That probably is a cell that's moving up into the, the spinous layer. Sometimes irritation change can cause that. If you have a nevus that's regrowing after a biopsy, a recurrent nevus, it can have some upward scatter. But everything else here looks great for a nevus. Histologically on, on H&E, from this case, if I recall correctly, there was not very much cytologic atypia, and uh, there's just this rare single upward spread. To me, in, you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously, but to me, I don't, I think in this case, that one finding by itself doesn't worry me. I see a rare upward spread of melanocytes in benign nevi on a regular basis. So, so that by itself doesn't worry me if it's just, you know, uh, rare. But again, if it's abundant, be very careful. That very well may be a melanoma. Okay, here's a case of a shave biopsy of a pigmented lesion. And uh, this was sent in, there's a dot put here, and the dot is because someone was worried about this case. I'm trying to get in focus here. They're worried about this particular area right here. Okay, so you can see um, that this uh, melanocytic lesion has elongated reedy ridges. It has pigment. You can see probably even from this power, um, I think it shows up on the screen here, that there's some pigment in here and there's some nests of melanocytes down, mostly down the tips and along the sides of the reedy. And some of those nests are bridging. They're skipping from reedy to reedy across the reedy. So this, I think, is a good example of a dysplastic nevus, also known as Clark's nevus. Now, this is a controversial and kind of complicated topic that we're not going to get into really in this video. That'll have to be saved for another video. But um, this, I think, fits uh, well enough, in my opinion, for, for uh, a dysplastic nevus. But the reason that this uh, was sent in for consultation is, look, there are, A, that, there's two things going on here that I think might concern someone. Number one, the melanocytes down the reedy look pretty busy. You can see that there are some nests, right? Some of these little areas look like they're probably nests, but there's a lot of single cells in here. Okay, now um, single cells are totally okay down in the reedy in general. That's, that's usually a fine and okay feature. What we don't want to see is spreading up, a lot of spread up between the reedy, and we don't want to see pagetoid spread, okay? So the, for one thing, the busyness down here can kind of catch your eye, and this lesion has what I kind of call a lentiginous growth pattern. It's got elongated reedy, increased pigment, and those types of nevi, whether they just be lentiginous, junctional or compound nevi or whether they actually be dysplastic nevi and I believe there's a lot of overlap between those those two those often cause problems for for um, the beginning uh, p person who's beginning in derm path or p for pathologists who don't see a lot of derm path because they look busy. They look like there's lots of increased cells in the uh, in the junction there that makes you worry that maybe it's a melanoma or something. And also because it's a little bit hard to visualize which cells are melanocytes and which cells are keratinocytes. So that's one feature that might that you might find concerning here. And clinically, look at all this pigment. This must have looked very, very dark, probably almost black clinically because of the abundant melanin pigment in here, okay? So number one, the busyness down in this area could be concerning to you. And then number two, there's some single cells up here that are, that are clear or pale. And those might look to the uninitiated or the untrained eye, those might look like pagetoid spread. But if you've watched my basic skin histology video, you'll know right away that those are definitely not melanocytes. Those cells are keratinocytes because they have naked nuclei. Their vacuole surrounds the nucleus. There's a little nucleus floating in the middle of a, of a vacuole that's artifactual. And then around the outside, they have pink cytoplasm. This one even has purple keratohyaline highland granules, and it has nice cell borders with its neighbors. And if you look really closely, sometimes you can see the uh, desmosome spines. And if you look here, these pigmented cells, which might be concerning also to the beginner, you'll know, again, if you've seen the skin histology video, that they have a little umbrella of pigment. Those are also keratinocytes. They're basal layer keratinocytes. So we don't even need a stain to know that both these cells and these cells are definitely not melanocytes, they're keratinocytes, okay? So when we look down here, it is a little harder. How do you tell which cells here are melanocytes and which ones are keratinocytes? Well, for one thing, the cells with the pigment, usually the abundant pigment in the, the cells usually indicates a keratinocyte if it's in the epidermis, or in the dermis, a melanophage, that is a histiocyte that's eaten melanin pigment. Here's one right here, okay? These cells and these cells are not melanocytes, okay? Now, there are some exceptions. Sometimes neva and melanomas both can have 
uh, pigment in the cytoplasm of the melanocytes, but it usually tends to be a little bit less abundant and kind of more uh, fine and dusty and in a gray cytoplasm background. So probably these cells right here, they kind of have a more gray cytoplasm and they've got a little specks of pigment in there. Those are probably uh, melanocytes, okay? But they're very intermingled down here and it's really hard to sort them out. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It doesn't really matter sorting them out because look where they are. Wherever they are, you can tell. It doesn't matter which cell's which down here because they're all down in the reedy and if you look up in between the reedy, there might be a couple melanocytes in here, but in general, the area between the reedy doesn't have a bunch of melanocytes and the area above that basement, uh, the basal layer up top doesn't have pagetoid spread. So this is probably not a melanoma, okay? But we're gonna look at a stain. This was sent in with a stain and we'll see if it can help us to visualize this lesion better, okay? Let's turn it around the right way. All right. So even from low power, what you can see on this piece right here is that all of the staining is down in the reedy, almost all of it. It's a really nice example. And this is a really good sign that you're probably dealing with a benign nevus rather than a melanoma. There is a little bit of occasional single cells in between the reedy. And this is, this is an MITF stain. It looks more or less equivalent to SOX10, although I think SOX10 is a little bit more crisp. And so in my lab, I personally prefer currently to use SOX10. And also SOX10 can be used for neural proliferations and a few other things. Whereas in my opinion, MITF is very limited in utility outside of looking at melanocytes in the epidermal junction. Uh, for other things, it's pretty nonspecific. It'll stain histiocytes and a variety of neo neoplasm. So I rarely use MITF anymore in, in my own lab because I have SOX10 available. Now look, if we get close, you can see what I was telling you earlier was true. I wasn't lying. Well, but I might not be able to get the, the slide on the right part of the scope. The cells up here with the little halos around them, dead negative. Those are keratinocytes. The cells here along the basal layer that have the little umbrellas of pigment, their nuclei are also dead negative. Those are keratinocytes, okay? So both of those cells are keratinocytes. The cells that have nuclear staining here, and even though it's a nuclear stain, um, there, there tends to be a little bit of bleeding of staining into the background cytoplasm of the melanocyte. So it's, it's, in my experience, relatively common, especially I think with the red chromogen, to be able to see a little bit of a background pink. That this, The pink by itself in the background cytoplasm doesn't really mean anything. It's really all about having the nucleus staining, okay, that tells you that the cells are melanocytes. And again, beyond the um, epidermis, I don't get too worked up if I see cells in the dermis that seem to be staining with MITF, unless they're obviously melanocytes. I don't really trust MITF once we're, we're down in the dermis or deeper because it can stain histiocytes and other things. But if you look here, this is a beautiful example of, of how intermingled the melanocytes and keratinocytes are down these reedy. And you can tell the keratinocytes are the ones with the negative uh, nuclear stain and the melanocytes are the ones that are positive. And you can also tell that they're almost all down in the reedy, in the sides and the tips of the reedy, and they're kind of bridging from reedy to reedy, which is a typical one of the features of dysplastic nevus, but can also be seen in some other types of nevi too. And then up in the upper parts of the epidermis and the spinous layer and the granular layer, there are no melanocytes here. So this is a very reassuring immunostain here. So for cases where you don't have a good, um, uh, where you're having trouble telling the melanocytes and their growth pattern, sometimes a SOX10, or if you don't have that, an MITF can be useful in sorting out the growth pattern and helping you better visualize the pattern of growth. And I learned a, a great trick from my friend and colleague, Ben Wood, who practices in Australia. He said, if you go to the top of the dermal papillae and you draw a line, so it'd be like a line right along here. If you draw a line along the top of the dermal papillae, if most of the melanocytes are below that line rather than above it, it's more likely that you're dealing with a dysplastic nevus or some other type of nevus rather than a melanoma. And I think that's a beautiful rule. I learned that from him on Twitter, actually. And uh, he, he has lots of great practical tips like that and has a, a new paper out in Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine that teaches a lot of great melanocytic um, tips and tricks. And I'll put a link to that in the video description and comment section below. So a great example of using MITF or SOX10 to highlight the pattern in a kind of uh, busy looking junctional melanocytic proliferation. And in this case, it's a just plastic nevus. All right, here's a melanocytic proliferation that is inflamed. 
can see there are elongated reedy, the reedy kind of bridge. You can see this little band of fibrosis underneath, um, underneath and wrapping around the bridging reedy. And then there's inflammation and also a few nests of melanocytes here in the dermis. And this one also has like a little area of probably folliculitis in the middle of it. Sometimes nevi uh, get inflamed from a folliculitis and then get biopsied because they're, they're irritating to the patient so they go see their dermatologist. So from low power, I think the architecture here probably looks like a dysplastic nevus or Clark's nevus. The stain's a little bit dark, and H&E stains can vary from being very light to very dark, and every lab uh, does it a little differently. And sometimes if you see a stain that's either lighter or darker in staining than you're used to in your own lab, it can be a little challenging to tell the melanocytes apart from the keratinocytes and to see the overall architecture of the lesion, to see is there confluent growth, is there pagetoid spread, are there those malignant features that are worrisome to us that I talked about in my melanoma basics video. Okay, so let's look a little closer here on H&E. And again, most, most melanocytic lesions can be sorted out on H&E only. Uh, deeper levels are often helpful, but immunostains are not usually needed. But I've, I've obtained a few uh, for the purposes of this video for teaching. So here's one where you can see there's some nests in the dermis. There's also a lot of inflammatory cells. All this stuff's inflammation. And then in the, um, in the epidermis, in the junction, at closer look, you can actually easily tell the melanocytes apart from the keratinocytes. These gray guys here, or girls, guys or girls, whatever, whether melanocytes are boys or girls, I'm not sure. But anyway, these are melanocytes down here, and they're at the, um, the tips of the reedy. They also go up a little bit, kind of scattering up the sides of the reedy. But look in between the reedy, in the space above the dermal papilla. This is the dermal papilla, and this is the, the area of uh, the basal layer overlying the dermal papilla. There's really not much melanocytic activity here or here, here's another area, over here's an area. So that's good to have most of the melanocytes down in the reedy, in the bottom, the tips of the reedy or the sides of the reedy, and not in between the reedy, and not pagetoid up here in the spinous or granular layers. That's a good sign that you're dealing probably with a nevus, not a melanoma. Okay, so again, I think this one's dysplastic, and whether it's dysplastic or not dysplastic is probably not of great importance. We, we get real worked up about that currently in Dermpath, but honestly, the, the most important thing, in my opinion, is deciding if something's a melanoma or a nevus. That's way more important than exact subclassification of the nevus in general, okay? There's exceptions to all this stuff, but anyway, this one's quite inflamed. It's got a little bit of spongiosis over top of it. So let's look at the, um, the now that we've seen the H&E, let's look at some immunostains on this just for um, the purposes of education. Now this stain right here, actually without telling you, I can actually show you and you can probably with practice figure this out. This is a cytoplasmic marker, not a nuclear marker. It's a real strong, crisp cyto cytoplasmic stain. And you can see it's cytoplasmic because the nuclei in the middle of each cell are negative. There's, you can see a little negative uh, little hole that's not staining in the middle of each cell. Those are the nuclei of the melanocytes. The cytoplasm is strongly staining. And you can see these branching little filamentous kind of processes, these little dendrites coming out from the junctional melanocytes and kind of interspersing in between the neighboring keratinocytes, okay? So this stain is MART1 or melan A, which are more or less equivalent. I think they're different clones, but MART1 is what I usually refer to it as, but it's, it's basically the same thing as melan A. HMB45 would have a very similar appearance, but in my opinion, is usually a little bit less crisp and kind of more uh, grainy or granular looking. I personally like MART1 better. But I don't really like MART1 for looking at the epidermal component of melanocytic proliferations. I don't like it for assessing um, how many nuclei there or how many melanocytes there are and if there's pagetoid spread or confluent growth. The reason is this. With practice, you can do it. But look at this thing from low power. It looks very busy. It looks like there's so many melanocytes in here. It makes you think, oh, Oh, it's confluent growth. Look, it's a solid line running along here, okay? Well, for one thing, it's important to remember that bridging, if you're not careful, bridging can make you think that's not confluent growth here. And the reason is because the basal layer isn't running all the way along here. The basal layer also goes up in between each of those, those fused reedy in this dysplastic neva. So if we get closer, I think we can see it. So here is a dermal papilla. Here's one right here. Here's another right here. Here's another right here. Remember that the actual basement membrane or the basal layer with the basement membrane under it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Yes, these reedy fuse together, but remember there's inner reedy space here. And if it's truly confluent, it's usually going to go up the the uh, the inner side of the 
the reedy and over the top of the dermal papilla and back down the other side. So it'll go up and down, not only across. So if you just see bridging uh, the what looks like confluence in the bridging nest at the tips of reedy, but not in between the reedy and not in the spinous layer, then that's probably not true confluence, okay? So here again, this is a dysplastic nevus, but it's a little hard to tell because it looks so much more cellular, so much more busy than it looked on H&E. And the reason is this, if you go back again to the basic skin histology video I made, it talks about melanocytes and how they use, they make melanin pigment and feed it to their neighboring keratinocytes via dendritic processes. Well, these dendritic processes spread out a good ways away from the actual body of each melanocyte. And so what we're looking at here is a two-dimensional slice through the piece of tissue. And we're seeing little dendritic processes. Not, we're not only seeing the cells, the, the melanocytes with their cytoplasm and their nucleus that are in this plane of section, but we're also seeing lots of branches processes that are both deeper and that are both further in and further out of this plane of section that we're looking at. If we would have looked at a, a couple of previous slices off of the microtome and a couple of deeper slices, we'd be seeing those melanocytes that we're seeing the processes of now. It's a little hard to grasp at, at first until you learn to think in three dimensions, but see like right here in this area, look. We're seeing red staining, but there's no, there's no body, there's no nucleus. That's because the body of those melanocytes there is probably a little deeper into the block or else we've already cut through it. So we're seeing a lot more staining than we would expect because we're seeing neighboring melanocytes from other planes of section that are sending their processes in. So it makes the, st the slide look a lot busier with all of that dendritic stuff. Even the melanocytes in this plane of section look a lot busier because again, it's not just showing you the nuclei, it's, they're all blurred together because they're, they're, their cytoplasm's kind of squished together, their cytoplasmic processes are kind of overlapping in the section, and so when it stains, the stain's so strong that it makes it just look solid. And you can't actually see, whereas if you do a nuclear stain, you could actually count the melanocytes if you wanted to. I don't do that. I just look at them and, and assess the pattern visually, but you could quantify them and it would be impossible to count how many melanocytes are in this field right here, okay? And then again, look at lower power and just see how busy that is. I think again, with practice you can do this, but for beginners and for people who don't do a lot of derm path, I really caution against using cytoplasmic stains like MART or HMB45 for trying to decide if there's pagetoid spread or confluent growth just because it's harder to interpret. It's a lot, it's a lot busier, okay? You can see again that there are a couple nests of melanocytes down in the dermis and that most of the other dermal cells, like I told you uh, a minute ago, they're actually just inflammation. So MART1 is a good stain if you say have a melanoma in situ and you're trying to see is there dermal invasion that's hiding in the midst of really brisk uh, host response, background inflammation. A MART1 is a nice stain then because it's really crisp and really strong and if there's any melanocytes there it'll help pick them up and, um, and that works pretty well in that context. I also like MART1 looking for metastatic melanomas, things like that, it can be useful in that context as well. But but for looking at the junctional component, for looking for confluence or pagetoid spread, it's not my favorite stain. It can be used with practice, but if you don't have a lot of experience, then I would say that it's uh, relatively tricky. But you can see, even to the uninitiated eye, there's a little bit of background debris here. The stain was a little dirty this time for some reason, but you can see there's no pagetoid spread, right? All of the melanocytes, again, if you, if you use this trick that Ben Wood taught me and you draw a line across the tops of the, uh, the dermal papillae, almost all of the melanocyte activity, it's almost all down below that line and not above it, which is a good reassuring sign for a nevus. Let's look at a SOX 10 from the same exact case and see the difference. Look at that. Look at how much less cellular this lesion looks when we use a nuclear stain like SOX10. It's easy to see, again, you could see it on the last slide on the MART1, but it's so much easier to appreciate here, I think, on the SOX10 that the melanocytes are down in the reedy, on the sides of the tips of the reedy and not in between the reedy. And the inter reedy space you can see is, is spared. See, there's the space, of the area above the dermal papilla. Okay, there's one melanocyte there. None here. There's very few in between the reedy. Again, the cells up top in the spinous layer that have halos around them, those of course are keratinocytes. They are not going to stain. The cells with umbrellas of pigment over top of them on the basal layer here, those are basal keratinocytes. They are not going to stain. They are negative on SOX10. So you can see very nicely here, again, the same features we saw in the MART. It's just so much easier, I think, with a nuclear stain like SOX10 to appreciate that. I think there's an area up here too that you can see.
I can get it on the, the screen. Yeah, really nice, uh, obvious uh, here that you can see the melanocytes down the reedy and very little in between the reedy and no pagetoid spread in this case, okay? And occasional rare pagetoid cells can be seen in any sort of nevus, particularly when they're irritated. Sometimes in dysplastic nevus, you can see occasional cells coming up into the spinous layer. But if you see very many, or if there are other atypical features present, you've got to be really careful about that. And again, refer to my um, basic uh, melanoma uh, pathology video that goes over the basic details of all of that. So I would classify this as a dysplastic nevus, and it's an example of looking at it with MART1 and SOX10 to help you assess the, um, the staining pattern and the pattern of melanocyte growth. All right, so here's a lesion, um, a shaved biopsy of a pigmented lesion from skin on the face of an older person who has been out in the sun quite a bit, and you can tell because of the massive amount of solar elastosis in the dermis. And looking at the epidermis, even from lower power, you can see multiple nests. Some of them are kind of gray or pink, and other ones have a lot of melanin pigment. Uh, it doesn't look like a very big lesion, and it looks from here relatively well nested, like more like a nevus. Let's look a little closer and see what the cytology of these cells looks like. There's a bunch of lymphocytes down there in the dermis. But honestly, if you had to decide purely on looking at the cells and the pattern of growth, most of the cells are in nests, it seems. Most of them are very small and kind of nevus-like. Not terribly concerning, but I'm always concerned when I see a junctional nevus or what I think is a junctional nevus on the face or the head and neck, particularly of old sun damaged people with a lot of solar elastosis in the dermis. And the reason is because a lot of times when you actually investigate further with immunostains, you find out that those lesions end up being melanoma much of the time. Not always. It's not that you can't have a nevus on the face of an older person. Intradermal nevi we see all the time, but the junctional ones I get really concerned about when I see those. And I'm gonna show you exactly why with this case. So um, SOX10 is the stain that I used here, and that's my, my kind of go-to stain when I want to investigate how many melanocytes are um, in the junctional component or the epidermal component of a melanocytic proliferation. You can see here a little hint at what's gonna happen. Look, there's some melanocytes starting to go down this follicle. It's a little hard to tell how many there are. They're certainly there at the top, and they're starting to look a little more atypical. But again, most of the melanocytes up here do not look very atypical. They're very small. Now here is the SOX10 stain, and even from low power, you can tell there are a lot more red nuclei there than we could begin to appreciate on the H&E. It's one of those cases where you actually like look at the slide to make sure there wasn't some swap or something. You just can't believe that there's this much, uh, there's this many extra melanocytes. The melanocytes are in nests, but there's also a lot of single cells in between, and you can see runs of confluence of single melanocytes going down the infundibula of the hair follicles here. And there's not much pagetoid spread, and that's because the, this is the lentigo maligna type of melanoma in situ. And lentigo maligna tends to not have a lot of pagetoid spread. It can, but it doesn't always. A lot of times it doesn't. Here's the other, the other piece. And again, there's just way, way more here than, than meets the eye on the H&E. And when I see abundant uh, single melanocytes with, with a, lot of, uh, a lot of them crowding together, crowding out the keratinocytes, that worries me for confluent growth for melanoma. And when I see, uh, particularly when I see extension of those single melanocytes down into hair follicles or sweat ducts, that's another sign of uh, probable confluence. So for me, this is a melanoma in situ. And you know, the, the amount of staining, how much is enough to call it confluence or to call it melanoma is very subjective and there is a threshold there. And in sun damaged skin, it's quite hard because you can have a lot of, of melanocytic hyperplasia in the background. Like this stuff here, it might be just background increase melanocytes from sun damage. But this stuff in here to me is just too much. So I think this is melanoma on the basis of this uh, confluent growth of single melanocytes along the uh, basal layer. Here's another case. Now this one is I think on the shoulder if I recall. And from low, let's get a this is the lowest we can go actually. From low power here, you can see it's a shave 
that's been divided into three pieces. But actually, you can't see it, but on the slide tray here, there's another slide from the same specimen that's a couple other slices. So this was actually a pretty large kind of uh, saucerization or a big scooped shave. And this lesion's quite broad. So it, it's a broad lesion, which doesn't mean it's malignant, but certainly when I see a really broad junctional melanocytic lesion and the patient has some degree of sun damage, I stop and think a little bit more carefully about it, even if I think it looks like a nevus. And to me, again, this, this case looks relatively like a junctional nevus um, or maybe a dysplastic nevus if you, if you like to use that term. Um, we'll have to make another video about that since it's controversial. Most of the melanocytes are down in the tips of the reedy and we don't see uh, pagetoid spread. There's some vacuolated keratinocytes up here, but we don't see pagetoid melanocytes. And I can't really appreciate any definitive confluence in between the reedy. But I do see some areas like this that when I look closer, they seem, the word we use is busy. It seems like there's some extra cells in the, ba the basal layer, and I'm having a hard time appreciating how many of those cells are melanocytes versus keratinocytes, or maybe some of them are even inflammatory cells mixed in there. So when I see kind of a busy looking epidermis and I'm having trouble on H&E deciding what kinds of cells are there or what the pattern is, to me this is a great time to use the, the immunostain like socks because it really just helps you see the pattern of the lesion. Again, the stain by itself doesn't prove a diagnosis of melanoma alone, but it can help you when you're having trouble with visualizing uh, the lesion. Obviously, we know this is a melanocytic lesion, so we don't need the sock stain to prove to us that there are melanocytes here. I just find the sock stain helpful in sorting them out. If I had to make a diagnosis on H&E only here, I would favor a nevus, actually, because there are, it looks like a lentiginous nevus, long reedy, some single cells and small nests, mostly down the tips of these long reedy, um, and there's some pigmented keratinocytes along the basal layer. But when a SOX was done on this case, this is actually a really good example to me of what confluent growth looks like. We have uh, not uh, basically nothing in the way of pagetoid spread, but we have single melanocytes, not just down the tips of reedy, but running up and down in between in the inter-reedy space, almost completely replacing the basal layer keratinocytes. Now you can see some little areas of this in irritated nevi and in other things. We can see it starting to maybe go down a follicle over here. Up here, it really looks more like a nevus. So it's possible that this is a melanoma in situ that's growing out of a background of a nevus. I thought this case was particularly subtle and challenging, um, but I, I'm quite concerned when I see that kind of finding right there, when I see lots of single melanocytes going up and down in between the reedy spaces, particularly in an older patient in sun-damaged skin. So we interpreted this as a melanoma in situ, probably arising in the background of a nevus. I think there's a second, this is the second slide on this case. Again, you can see the, the section's a little bit torn up, but you can see numerous single uh, melanocytes trickling along the basal layer. And also from, from time to time, you can see a couple of uh, pagetoid cells in here too. So there's a little bit of pagetoid spread, it's just not abundant. So I think a pretty good example to me of confluent growth and, and uh, confluence is a term that we like to throw around in Dermpath, but in real life, it's often pretty hard to evaluate. But to me, when you see it look like this, this is pretty good for confluent growth. And um, obviously you have to piece all the pieces together. I think again, this is from the H&E, this little area here was very bland and looked like a little nevus. So I think this is either an incidental nevus under the, under the melanoma or maybe a, a nevus that the melanoma in situ uh, grew out of. Let's look at this excision. This is a big piece of skin, all the way down deep into the subcutis, down to about the fascia level. So you know right away when you see a piece this big, probably someone at some point made a biopsy diagnosis of malignancy. You know, otherwise you're usually not going to be removing this much skin from a person. So that's a way you can kind of cheat a little bit when uh, an attending is showing you a case and saying, "Hey, what's this? If it's a huge slab of skin, it probably came from a cancer excision." All right, so anyway, you can tell this patient is probably an adult. They're probably older. This is probably the face. They've got massive sebaceous glands, tons of them, and, and a bunch of hair follicles. And um, so there's sebaceous hyperplasia here. There's also a bunch of solar elastosis here. Look at all that. That's what sun damage does to your skin after years and years. Those squiggly little purpley blue things are elastic fibers, bad stuff. So this patient did have a diagnosis of a cancer and that cancer was melanoma. Here's a melanoma right here. 
and you can see these big atypical melanocytes spreading along here. There's a bunch of vacuole artifact over them. Um, and they're basically trickling along. Let's see if I can get the color right here. Trickling along the basal layer, replacing the basal keratinocytes. And these are big, huge, atypical melanocytes. Having a little trouble, it's a little bit hyperchromatic looking, but that's, uh, I think, the white balance I have on the camera. In any case, you can see that they're, they're atypical cells right there. And if we go over a little further, here's more. And this is that layer of, of single melanocytes that's really replacing much of the basal layer. So that's confluent growth there. So in a case like this, you don't really need an immunostain. This is obviously melanoma. There's even some large discohesive nests. But uh, uh, for the sake of teaching, we performed a stain here to show um, the, the melanoma, for one thing, but also in contrast to look at the background skin. So there's the melanoma, there's a little bit, here's the biopsy scar right here. But if we go out way away from the melanoma, far out to the edge of the biopsy out here, let's look at what the melanocytes look like in this, this older sun damaged person's skin. There are scattered enlarged melanocytes. There's one, there's one, there right there. And you can tell them apart, I think, on the H&E here, but notice they're a lot more, they're a lot larger, and they're a lot greater in number than in normal skin on non-sun damaged uh, areas. So again, this is the solar-induced melanocyte hyperplasia, and this can be really problematic, this stuff in the background, when a patient has a melanoma in situ and you're trying to assess the margins. Seeing where the melanoma ends, this is melanoma here, and, and transitions into just increased background melanocytes due to sun damage can be a real challenge. And, and immunostains don't always make the problem better. Sometimes they even make it worse, especially if you don't have experience with looking at these stains because of the high uh, number of uh, melanocytes that are present in sun damaged skin and the fact that they get larger and atypical. So let's look at the immunostain. We'll use SOX10 here as a comparison. Here's the area that's obviously melanoma. Even from low power, you can see confluence. Pretty much the entire basal layer is, is mostly replaced by these large atypical uh, melanocytes that have nice nuclear staining for SOX10. You can see nesting also. Here's a discohesive kind of nest. There's even a few scattered pagetoid cells here, but, but not very many pagetoid cells because again, this is the lentigo malignant pattern of melanoma, which tends to predominate along the basal layer uh, and usually doesn't have that much in the way of pagetoid spread. And so look, I think here you can kind of see nicely, that's melanoma for sure. And out here though, look, there's definitely increased melanocytes, but they look quite different. I think even honestly, the change probably happens somewhere around here, that's melanoma. What about this stuff? Well, they trickle down the follicle a little bit, but they're still pretty spaced out. See what I mean? It can be kind of subjective and hard to tell. I think this case is a really nice example though, because you can see that these melanocytes, even though they're larger than the melanocytes in normal, non-sun damaged skin, they are nowhere near as atypical and huge as these guys over here. So you really can tell, I mean, look, this is right here. We've got a normal melanocyte down this follicle, right? or a sebaceous gland, part of a follicular structure. And then up here, much larger, the atypical melanocytes. Now, the problem is, is that some cases of lentigo maligna have relatively small melanocytes and not these big ugly ones and, and don't always have nests. And so those cases can be very challenging to tell apart from melanocytic hyperplasia. But I think it's really good to get an idea of this is what normal skin, this is, this is the new normal for old sun damaged white patients, okay? And in my practice, I see lots of light-skinned people that have been out in the sun for their whole life and they're in their 80s now and then we see biopsies for a variety of things and so I've gotten used to seeing this as being a relatively normal for an older person on their face okay the problem is is that people that have not had a lot of experience in derm path can really struggle and say oh my gosh look at this this is really bad there's all these melanocytes here and it still is a struggle for me even it can be subjective and difficult but I think one of the best uh, bits of advice I give to my own residents is that they should when they're in practice if they end up looking at cases like this, they should take some cases of basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma on the excision specimen. So someone who's, who's got a lot of sun damage and then, and then but, but has a cancer that's not melanoma. And when that skin comes out, 
take a few different cases of that and try SOX 10 staining or whatever stain you're going to choose to use. Again, SOX 10 is my favorite. Um, and then, then look at that microscopically and see what the background melanocytes look like in someone who doesn't have melanoma. And that will give you a better idea of, oh wow, you really can have an increased number. The time to learn what melanocyte hyperplasia looks like is not when you're reading the margins on a melanoma case. That's a bad time to start thinking about, oh, I should probably learn what melanocyte density is normal for sun damaged skin on old people. You should learn in a setting where you're very unlikely to have an incidental melanoma. Yeah, could you have a melanoma in situ incidental next to a basal or squame? Yes, yeah, sure you could, but if you take 10 cases and do that, not every one of those patients is probably going to have an incidental melanoma right next to their basal or squame. In fact, I only see that occasionally, um, even though I see a large number of skin biopsies and skin excisions. So, um, so anyway, looking at background skin when you know there's not going to be melanoma there is a great way to learn what the density looks like in old sun damaged uh, adults and I think this is a particular challenge in um, in uh, dermatopathology and that's an easy way to fix it is just by looking at a lot of cases and getting a feeling I think here even though the numbers increased one thing is the melanocytes are are relatively small although like I mentioned they can be larger they can be atypical you can get scattered cells that are pretty large and even binucleated and and when I see just random single cells like that in sun damaged skin far away from a melanoma, to me that's not that doesn't concern me for melanoma because I see those kinds of cells in sun damaged skin scattered um, often. So so even even when there are some larger atypical cells, as long as they're spaced out evenly and not directly adjacent to a melanoma, there's a good chance that what you're dealing with is just reactive change in background melanocytes due to a, a lifelong exposure to the sun. Okay. The other thing is that we don't have any nests here. We don't have any areas of confluence. The cells are increased in number but they're still spaced out by normal keratinocytes. So they're, they're kind of uh, uh, trickled out evenly. And the other thing that's helpful, there's no pagetoid spread, no nests. And one thing that helps me too is, look at this. I think when you look at the background skin away from the melanoma and you see increased melanocyte density, keep looking, keep looking. It's basically, if you look at the rest of this excision, the melanocyte density is about this level on every piece of skin from, from margin to margin across the entire wide local excision specimen. To me, that's helpful. Could you have a melanoma that's that broad? Absolutely. Lentigo malignus can be really big and they can go wall to wall, but when you've got areas of obvious melanoma like this, and then all of the rest of the specimen looks like this in density, chances are what you're dealing with is this is their normal background. So I think that's sometimes helpful. On a small biopsy, I would approach areas like this a little bit differently. I might be a little bit more cautious about how I worded things. If it was a small biopsy, I might wonder, are we at the edge of a melanoma and I just can't see it? Here on an excision, I think it's much easier um, most of the time. So that's uh, one slide. I think here's another slide from the same case. And here's the melanoma. Again, big nests, they're kind of discohesive and falling apart. A few pagetoid cells in there, definitely confluent, just really nicely replacing most of the basal layer. Still a few keratinocytes left in there, but really much of it's getting crowded out of the way by the melanocyte overgrowth. And then out here is probably their background solar induced hyperplasia, just like that other area. Increase the number but still pretty spread out and, and um, separated from one another by keratinocytes. Let's look at the other edge of the specimen. This is melanoma out here. Look at how confluent that is and there's pagetoid spread. Now, one other thing while we're on this slide to bring up is what do we do with cells like this? random single small nuclei in the dermis. Well, I tell you what, this is kind of problematic, I think, and I see this both on SOX 10, and I also sometimes see it on MART 1. I'm not really sure why it happens on MART 1. Uh, mast cells can sometimes pick up MART 1 staining in a weak kind of granular pattern, but what I've seen before is not that. It's actually strong staining, but on small little cells in the dermis, and I, I don't know what it is, but I don't think it can, can be melanoma because I see it all the time in almost every case. And I see the same thing here on SOX 10. I think on SOX 10, probably what we're dealing with are small um, Schwann cells may be associated with single nerve fibers that are running through the dermis here that are just too small to see. I don't know that for sure. There may be some other cell that's picking up 
um, socks in the dermis. Here we've got a couple, uh, this is like a little bud coming down from the epidermis, uh, either a part of a sweat duct or a hair follicle or just a reedy ridge and it's got a couple of melanocytes in it. So those are all within the epidermis, still just an extension of it. But these single ones in the dermis, I think um, sometimes uh, get, get people a little worried, but when I see single cell staining that are small and not large and atypical and not nested, and they're kind of just single rare cells in the dermis, I tend to disregard that on SOX10 and also even on MART1. Again, if they're small and single like that guy right there, no way, I don't think that could possibly be invasive melanoma. And again, I see this on like almost every case. So I just don't think it's possible that, that there are these single scattered invasive melanoma cells. There may be literature about this. There's literature about SOX10 staining and scars. I'm not sure if there's literature about these rare SOX10 positive cells in the dermis, but in my practice, I have definitely seen this. So if you notice that, see, look, way down here even, there's some single random SOX10 positive cell, way far away down below the tumor, not nested, not large and atypical, nothing else around it. I'm not sure what this cell is. I suspect it's a little Schwann cell, but I definitely don't think it's melanoma. So anyway, if you notice those, that's the way I approach them. Uh, you, can, you can handle them how you like in your practice, but uh, I definitely noticed that. And also note, in case you haven't noticed before, that SOX10 stains a subset of the cells in the eccrine coil. So it's totally normal to have SOX10 staining in an eccrine coil, don't get freaked out by that. That's a normal finding. And in fact, some sweat gland tumors like spiradenomas and cylindromas are usually strong diffuse SOX10 positive. And there have been some papers published that showed that um, in the past couple years. So a nice example, I think, of a lentigo maligna with SOX10 staining and contrasting that with solar-induced melanocyte hyperplasia in the background in sun-damaged skin. So I hope that's a helpful uh, for you to see how I kind of approach these cases in this uh, challenging setting in my practice. So here is a different scenario than what we've been looking at. Here's a nodule of tumor in the dermis and it was uh, shaved off here and you can see it's a little bit pedunculated and pushed up from the skin surface and it's a nodule of uh, pink or blue cells it's a little hard to tell it looks kind of like a mixture of cells maybe and when we look closer these cells could be melanocytes but they also could be histiocytes they could be other things you might wonder about a variety of different options in this case and in fact, they are making small nests. And these did turn out to be melanocytes on immunostains, but this is the kind of setting when you've got a sheet of cells in the dermis and uh, you're wondering what kind of cells they might be and you think maybe they could be melanocytic. This is the kind of time where we can use immunostains. And the, the approach to immunohistochemistry in this type of a melanocytic lesion is a little bit different. And notice up here, there the epidermis is uninvolved. There's no... Uh, uh, junctional or in situ component. So uh, this, uh, this could either be a nevus or a melanoma. In fact, this turned out to be a melanoma, kind of an unusual one. It did have mitosis and some atypia. So it's kind of a nevoid melanoma. Uh, it has a nevus-like look, but it had mitotic activity deep down in the lesion and atypical cells. Uh, but let me show you, the reason I'm showing this is not because it's a classic uh, melanoma is because the immunostains that we have with it are actually quite nice to show the different, um, the different ways immunohistochemistry can be used in a case like this. So here is to start out with, this is a stain for SOX10. And you can see that SOX10 again is a really nice, strong nuclear stain, very crisp, stains the, um, the melanocyte nuclei. And the background cells, which would be in this case fibroblasts, lymphocytes, histiocytes, kind of an inflammatory reaction to this tumor, they're negative. So it's a really nice stain to sort out um, the melanocytes from other non-melanocytic cells. And let's look up here at the, the uh, epidermis. There's no melanoma in situ component. All we see are the small, scattered, normal melanocytes in the background along the basal layer. And look at how crisp and clean that is. Again, this is why I really love SOX10. It's a really great stain um, because of how cleanly it stains uh, melanocytes. Do remember, it also stains uh, Schwann cells and also can stain uh, eccrine coils and some other things. All right, so that's SOX10. Now let me show that in, on this same case in direct contrast to, to MITF. And now MITF is also a uh, nuclear stain, but like I mentioned earlier in the video, 
it tends to be a little less clean in my experience. It stains the nucleus very nicely, right? But it also has kind of some bleeding over into the cytoplasm. You can also see this on SOX10, especially with the red chromogen. I feel like it sometimes bleeds and kind of makes the cytoplasm have like a, a kind of a, a slight um, coloration. Um, in this case, it's a little bit brown with the red chromogen and be a little bit pinkish colored. And um, looking up at the surface, again, it highlights the, the uh, junctional, I'm sorry, the basal layer normal melanocytes very nicely. It highlights their nuclei, shows them nice and evenly spaced out between keratinocytes. But remember what I mentioned earlier, MITF will stain melanocytic lesions in the dermis, but it will also stain many histiocytic things. So I personally do not trust MITF alone if it's the only marker. I, in, and we're talking about something in the dermis or the lymph node or the deep soft tissue, I do not trust MITF by itself to prove that something has melanocytic differentiation. I want to see a SOX10 or a MART1 or an S100, even something else to help prove that because a lot of histiocytic things can stain with MITF. Cellular neurothechiomas, which can come in the differential with melanocytic things, they'll stain with MITF. So it's a relatively non-specific marker. In the epidermis, it works great. Okay, In the epidermis, if it's staining something, that thing is probably a melanocyte. But in the dermis, all bets are off. It could be something else. So MITF is not my favorite stain, but it does work um, it, for looking at junctional things if you don't have uh, SOX10. Now, here's an example of MART1 or melan A. And let's see if I can go to lower power. Look at that. Compare that to the SOX10. A lot of the lesion seems to be negative or only weakly staining. There's a really strong staining nodule down at the bottom of the, let me see if I've got a better area. Yeah, down at the bottom of the, uh, the lesion. That's very strong. It's got strong, crisp cytoplasmic staining. And if you look out here, we know that some of this at least is melanocytic because of the SOX10 stain, but much of it is, is negative or only weak kind of patchy positivity. And in my experience, that's what happens is in melanomas, either metastatic melanomas, which when you see a ball of melanoma in the dermis like this, the differential is this could be a, met a metastasis, a local recurrence, a satellite lesion, or rarely we do see primary melanomas that are only in the dermis. And whether that's because they've lost their epidermal in situ component or because they're true primary dermal melanomas, which is a controversial and, and if it's a real thing, it's probably very rare. Regardless of the situation, anytime we see melanoma only in the dermis, like a ball, a nodule of melanoma like this, we always have to think of metastasis and have to bring that up to our clinical colleagues so they can exclude that possibility with clinical workup. But anyway, in my experience, metastatic melanomas or large nodules of melanoma, they tend to start to lose MART1 and HMB45. They'll usually retain S100 in SOX, although they can have patchy loss of that as well. But bigger, bulky melanomas, particularly metastatic lesions in my experience, will often be MART1 only focally positive or sometimes totally lost. So what is helpful here is if you have a nodule of something and you think it's melanoma in the dermis, say, say the patient has a known history and you think this is a metastasis, and you throw on a MART1 stain and it's positive, you're done. It's, it's probably metastatic melanoma. If it looks malignant, they have a history, it makes sense clinically. But if it's negative, don't stop there. Make sure you use S100 or SOX10, something else like that. So um, my approach varies kind of depending on the situation. Because MART1, again, is very specific. There are very few other things that stain with MART1. Picomas can, and um, I think adrenocortical tumors can, uh, which obviously we don't see in the skin, or at least I've never seen in the skin. But picomas can occur in the skin sometimes. They usually have a distinct look. And you can watch my video on primary cutaneous picoma if you're curious about that. Um, and then the, so anyway, MART1 is a useful stain in this context, but do remember that you can sometimes have loss of MART1. The other thing is look here, again, like we've shown in the other, other parts of this video, beautiful example of that strong cytoplasmic staining and the dendritic processes staining. And look, you've already seen what SOX and MITF look like in this skin overlying this lesion. Look at how much busier and how much more cellular it looks when we look at the MART1 stain. And again, that's because the cytoplasm staining so the cells look bigger. The dendritic processes are staining from the melanocytes. It makes it look like there's more there than actually is. Oh, and actually, I think you can even see right here. No, maybe not. I was going to say it looked like you could see processes up higher up in the, the epidermis, but oh well, maybe not. But anyway, it's a good example of the nice crisp staining, but uh, kind of over staining almost that you see with MART1. So that's why I'm a little hesitant to use MART1 in the junctional 
component of a melanocytic lesion, but it's really good looking at intradermal stuff. Now this stain right here, this is S100 protein, and S100 is very, very sensitive. It can rarely be lost in melanomas, but if it, if it is lost, it's usually only partial loss or the other, other markers will be retained. I've seen, I can probably count on maybe two hands now. I've been doing Dermhealth for a little while now. Um, six years of practice plus my fellowship year, I think I've seen maybe 10 or 12 melanomas that had lost, significant loss of S100. Um, it's, it happens, but it's really uncommon, and I see melanomas daily, so, so the, um, this is not a common finding. It does happen, though. Um, but this is a really strong stain, but again, remember, it's very sensitive, but not totally specific. It stains lots of other things. And again, it's a cytoplasmic and nuclear stain. So you'll see this strong staining both in the cytoplasm and the nuclei. Real good example. Not a lot of stains in pathology that do that, that have nuclear plus cytoplasmic staining. Calretinin, there's probably some others I'm not thinking of, but in the skin, at least S100 is the main one that we end up seeing. And then up there, Look at the epidermis, way busier, and again, that's because those cells in the mid, the mid level of the spinous layer, those are not, mel um, not melanocytes, but rather, those are dendritic Langerhans cells, and they look very similar in shape to melanocytes because they're branching processes, but they're in the mid level of the epidermis, in the, in the middle of the spinous layer. Those are Langerhans cells, and notice again that along the basal layer where, the, where we were seeing those normal junctional melanocytes, on MITF and SOX, you can see some of them here, but in some areas they don't really stand out, and that's like I said earlier in the video, that S100 for some reason doesn't always pick up the normal junctional melanocytes quite as well as the other stains, and I'm not exactly sure why. It should pick them up, but in my experience it oftentimes um, doesn't. It'll look like there's there's fewer melanocytes at the junction than there are at the basal layer than there actually are if you use an S100 stain. So that's part of uh, that's one reason I don't like looking at S100 for looking at junctional melanocytic proliferations, and also because you're going to see tons and tons of Langerhans cells in the background. And Langerhans cells also can be in the dermis too. And there are other forms of dendritic cells that can express S100 that we can see in the dermis. So S100 will often have a busy kind of even if there wasn't a ball of melanoma down here in the dermis. In any inflamed dermis, you're going to see a lot of S100 positive cells. That's a normal thing, okay? So uh, S100, really useful in certain contexts, but you got to be careful because it stains so many different things, so many different components, uh, Langerhans cells, other dendritic cells, um, things like that. It's going to potentially throw you off, especially on like a lymph node. If you use S100 on sentinel nodes, you just have to really learn that it, it's not in my experience, it's not helpful for finding tiny little metastases of melanoma. If there's a big ball of melanoma, a big nodule of it in the node, well, fine, then the S100 will be helpful there. But otherwise, S100 has tons of staining in the nodes, and that's usually because of dendritic cells that are there, part of the immune system. Here's a, a contrast. Here's a CD1A stain. CD1A is a relatively specific marker of uh, Langerhans cells and can also, I think, stain some other closely related forms of dendritic cells. But this is a nice example that most of that stuff we were seeing on the S100 in the in the epidermis, it really is Langerhans cell. It's staining with CD1A, which is a Langerhans marker. And you can also see scattered cells here in the dermis, which are also Langerhans cells. Because remember, they live in the epidermis and then they get exposed to antigen and they come down to the dermis, go through lymphatics back to the lymph node, and then they do their antigen presentation work in the uh, in the lymph nodes. At least that's my understanding. I, I'm not an immunologist, so there's probably a lot more to it than that, but that's the basics. So anyway, and the tumor, of course, uh, is dead negative here on the CD1A stain. There's a, a few scattered Langerhans cells in it, but the tumor cells are negative. So a nice example of a, of a nodule of melanoma in the dermis and kind of how you could approach that and the different pros and cons of each of the stains when you're trying to work up uh, something in that scenario.